Welcome to the Veritas Podcast. I'm Scott Veritas here with my co-host, Ben Rebellis. Barbie movie came out recently, and I know I said on the last show we wouldn't always be particularly topical on the show anymore. We were going to move in kind of a different direction. Um, but I do want to talk about the Barbie movie a little with the huge caveat that I haven't seen it. And I don't think Ben <laughs> has either. Nope. Neither of us wanted to spend two hours of our life watching the Barbie movie. We know a lot of people did last weekend, though, and there's been a lot of commentary and discourse around it. What I've heard about the movie, and I, I will put a, a huge disclaimer on on the first segment of today's show by admitting I have not seen the movie, so I'm not as informed as I could be on the content of the film, obviously. But what I've heard about it is from watching reviews, from talking to people who have seen it, including my, including my own girlfriend and some friends of hers. Um, I've heard that it is, my understanding is that it is very political, um, that it, they're literally the patriarchy is called out by name in the film, which is pretty overt. Um, I know there's at least one scene where Barbie goes into like the real world for the first time and she's immediately sexually assaulted by like a drunken frat guy on Venice beach. Uh, immediately. Like that's the first thing that happens to her when she goes into the real world. I know that, uh, there is a sort of like matriarchal society and then Ken goes to the real world and discovers the patriarchy and he actually really likes it. And he subverts the matriarchal society of the Barbies and then is easily overthrown during this sort of power struggle between the Kens and the Barbies. I know the Kens are generally portrayed as just sort of like useless, dumb himbos for the most part, except when Ken actually gains this like weird self-awareness. The movie just, it's very, obviously very political. And it seems to sort of hearken to a sort of overt, um, uh, sort of BuzzFeed feminism, sort of feminism that we haven't encountered that is very overtly misandrist, uh, that we probably haven't encountered or seen on uh, at this level in society since at least 2018, which is when Captain Marvel came out. It's when the, Cap uh, the um, Kavanaugh confirmation hearings were. Because I always think of this kind of feminism and feminist content as having peaked from 2014 to 2018. It was like this Cambrian explosion of, of a certain type of feminism. So... All of this is to say, I haven't seen the movie. We're not going to review Barbie on today's show. We're not going to talk about Barbie all day. But having heard what I've heard about it, I was a little disappointed because the movie was marketed as just being kind of like a fun movie with no politics. It's now made about a bajillion dollars. And I think that that really good marketing campaign is largely you know, to credit for that. They did a great job marketing it, leaving the politics out. So in terms of the whole go woke, go broke thing, which people are saying this counters that, I think you could kind of put the caveat that the film was marketed without any of its politics. The film was just marketed as being fun. And a lot of people who've seen it have told me they were disappointed. My girlfriend, who is not nearly as sensitive to this type of wokeness, political stuff in movies, said that even she found it a little obnoxious and honestly just didn't find the movie particularly good or particularly funny or insightful or interesting, uh, that it was very disjointed. So that's on on coming from my girlfriend and a couple other folks who've seen the movie. Um, of course, the critics have been like lavishing it with praise, but I feel like it's like illegal to dislike this kind of movie if you're a critic. You're like not allowed. I think that's kind of a thing. Same thing with like Captain Marvel. Uh, it's got like a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Something That's what like I was that. just looking yeah, for. Yeah, it, it's got it's got a pretty high, but 89. people that I've been seeing, and the audience score is pretty high too, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, 86. But people I've been speaking to, including at least one friend of my girlfriend's who's like not anywhere near me on the political spectrum, they they, they both didn't particularly find the movie that entertaining, um, especially w coming off all the hype that it had. But in any case... What this movie got me wanting to talk about is just sort of the state of gender relations, because this movie really encapsulates an us versus them mentality. That's what I don't like about it based on what I've been hearing. Again, I haven't watched it yet. I probably will at some point. But what I understand from the plot is that there's a very sort of us versus them mentality, men versus women, Ken's versus Barbies. And there's a lot of sort of just unhinged man hating. Uh, from what I've heard, including, again, a scene in which Barbie is sexually assaulted in broad daylight on Venice Beach. And that's her like first introduction to this supposedly very patriarchal society that is the real world. This is this that's that sort of thing sounds unhinged to me. I mean, to mm. include that in this type of supposedly very fun movie. So it just got me thinking about how I thought we were moving. I thought we were past this. I thought we were moving past this sort of like 
uh, on one hand, you can either be a misandrist, you know, feminist, Anita Sarkeesian type, or on the other hand, you can be a sort of misogynist manosphere type with like Andrew Tate or whatever. And we all just have to hate the opposite sex and try not to get fucked over by them and see if we can, you know, subvert one into, you know, have one submit to us in some ways so that we can actually procreate or whatever. It's a very weird thing where people say that we should operate as a society with the sexes opposed to each other, which is literally impossible. I thought we were past that, but the Barbie movie makes me feel like we're not. I don't know. And again, Ben, I know you haven't seen the movie either, but just what are what what are you feeling at this point about like where we are in relation to these issues? Because I, I really thought we were past this. I thought that people were starting to turn away from it a little bit, but it seems like there's still this very, very sort of us versus them mindset when it comes to men and women. Yeah, um, I haven't been to the movies since Star Wars 7 came out. Um, I just kind of stopped going to the movies uh, for, I guess, various reasons. I couldn't really pin any of them down. I mean, I remember, I would have thought this movie would be like, kind of like the Disney movies or maybe TV shows I grew up with, where, yeah, you kind of had this boys versus girls kind of. Girl it was always, power. It, it was kind of playful, you know, yeah. like. But, but it, so what I'm what I'm hearing from you and, and and I guess from some of the critics, this is not just the kind of that playful like oh the girls beat the boys at the big soccer game type of dynamic, which is what I would have, have hoped. Um, it, 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 there, listen, there's always been the phenomenon of a conflict, quote unquote, between the genders. I mean, I can remember going. <laughs> with my mom to the hairdresser for her to get her hair done and you'd hear some woman complaining about her husband and men in general with the, the ultimate conclusion be like well men are dicks or they're lazy or they work too much or they're entitled or whatever you know didn't the little rascals that really old show had something like the woman haters club like <laughs> we've always kind of had this Hostile is not the word I want to use. Uh, relationship between the sexes. And I think that's because we are different. We have different temperaments. We have phys physically, obviously, we're different, but we have different temperaments. That's always been true. And you can go to the likes of Christina Hoff Summers, Jordan Peterson. Like they'll talk about how men and women are just different in their temperaments and their interests and all those things. But the modern feminism, I guess, is what I should call it. The modern way that's looked at it is not only recognizing. A potentially uh, conflicts laden or um, contentious at times relationship between the sexes, but that those are a zero sum game. And that is what this is. So the attitude now is that if a man holds some prestigious position, it means that some woman doesn't have that position. And it's probably because that man screwed over that woman or the patriarchy or whatever, you know, that something went wrong because a woman's not holding this position that a man has. Um, and it's so simplistic, you know, you don't consider whether women were interested in competing for that position. It's just patriarchy bad. And of course they never turn themselves. That's back on, you know, female dominated professions, nursing, elementary school teachers. And I don't want to hear about how, uh, women were relegated to those positions because they're subservient to men. I've heard way too many teachers talk about how, uh, what's the word I'm working for? How, um, nourishing how rewarding being a teacher is i don't think they're doing it because some man wouldn't let them be a computer scientist or an engineer or an accountant um so to, i'm getting off my main point here with that is i think modern feminism has turned this as i termed it kind of playful competition between the sexes into a zero-sum game that means that uh, women are constantly oppressed yeah and that that's an insane way to order your society Right. That is a suicidal way to order your society, right. frankly. You, you, you cannot possibly have a functional society where men are so skeptical and vigilant of women fucking them over and vice versa. Like literally men and women, that's how we procreate. That's how we raise children. That's how we create families. That's how we create communities. And there's interesting conflicts that are going to arise and that have to be mediated in terms of the roles that men and women are going to play in those communities, in those families. Obviously on one end, you have traditionalists who think women do X, Y, and Z, men do X, Y, and Z. You have more quote unquote progressive types who thinks everyone should just be able to do whatever they want without any limitations. Then you have people in between like maybe Ben and I, I assume you kind of feel this way, Ben, which is like men and women have certain, you know, primordial desires and needs that are built into their DNA, but there should also be a little bit of leeway in terms of men wanting to do things that are a little more feminine and women that want to do things a little more masculine. That's right. where society, I think, has settled largely on those questions. But again, you have the people at the extremes pulling them in both directions. 
the thing that worries me right now is especially with younger men and younger women, I really, really worry because of the kinds of people they're looking up to because of the kind of content that they're consuming. I wonder if they're okay. I wonder if they're capable of mediating this conflict and of moving on from it because it's a very, very juvenile mindset. Mm -hmm. Us versus them. That's okay. If look, if you're a 16 year old boy and you kind of are like women are bitches, I kind of just want to have sex and get blown and fucking get pussy and fucking, you know, if that's your fucking, if you, if you just have like a completely juvenile view of the opposite sex when you're 16, you could overcome that and be fine because you're a child, you're a literal child. But as you get into adulthood and start to actually vote, uh, build businesses, you know, build families, b- build society and play a major part in society, you have to move on from that us versus them mentality. And if you're a woman that just feels like all men are fucking useless, you know, pigs who just want to have sex uh, and nothing else, you know, the sort of men only want one thing and it's disgusting meme. Again, that will be that will actually be more true both when you're a teenager. That's actually there's a little bit of truth to the fact that yes, teenage boys are not known for being particularly contemplative about who they sleep with or have relationships with. Um, but it, it, that's something that you'll be able to overcome if you just sort of move on from it as an adult. Um, I just I, I really worry though that when I look at the content coming out, especially in a space like TikTok uh, or on Twitter. The content that's coming from younger people, young women and young men, especially in Gen Z, um, it really makes me feel like there's a deep unwellness here and a, and a lot of anger and spitefulness. And I don't know if they're going to be able to overcome it. It seems like a lot of times, I think some people do grow out of it, um, but some people seem to be sort of letting it go with them into their, not just their 20s, but even their 30s and 40s. And it's and they'll live their whole lives just kind of as these very spiteful, misogynist or misandrist individuals. And I guess at this point, one of my big questions is like, how much of society is actually doing that well into like their adult years, into their 20s? Mm. I'm wondering if it's, is it 10%? We could probably do take care of that. Like that's a relatively small minority of people. But is, is it 50%? Is it 30%? Is it 80%? I'm very worried about like, what percent of people really do have this mentality. And when a movie like Barbie comes out and makes $170 million, I worry a little bit about the messaging that like young girls who go to see this movie are getting. Mm. I wonder about adults. So I agree that I think that's an interesting question of how many people carry this type of uh, 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 winner take all dog eat dog zero sum game mentality about the relationship between the sexes into adulthood. Another question that I wonder is how much of that is actually People who say things like that actually believe them. I wonder how much of it is performative. Like they go on Twitter or X. I don't know what we're going to call it now. It still says I'm literally on Twitter right now. And the URL says Twitter.com. And then there's an X down there. I don't know what to do. Call Twitter now. Not, not the point, but, I but think everyone's go, just going to keep saying Twitter for several years. I so, don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. But I wonder how many of these women are out there tweeting, xing the yes queen <laughs> mentality, you know, for some kind of banal, you know, girl boss type of thing. And they go home and they have, you know, a son that they treat with respect and love very much. And they have a husband that they love and have a completely amicable relationship with and good relationship with. But they still have this kind of idea of I want to raise up women against men publicly. Um, Of course, there's also, you know, you also wonder, like, is every instance of yes, queening some girl boss move actually an anti-male type of thing, which is kind of an interesting question um, and still is part of the zero sum mentality. So I, I, I wonder how much of it is overt. I wonder how much of it has been implanted and it's just kind of in there and how people uh, interact and kind of think about the world. Like this idea of every time it's the first woman African-American, you know, who did this thing, I just want them to say, I'm just good at what I did. Like, I, I don't care about this whole first woman thing for the, for the most part at this point in 2023, if there's a first, first woman of anything, it's probably an accident of history more so than it is conquering the patri- patriarchy. Um, so I, I do think it's an interesting question of how many people, actually believe this are going into real adulthood thinking that all men are terrible. I, you, we watched that. You sent me a link to that one uh, 
or no, I watched this on TikTok today of some woman um, telling her 13-year-old niece, like, all men are awful, and your job as a woman is to find the least awful of them. Like, is that person, how is how happy is that person? How much should they really be giving advice? And how much do they really believe that instead of just saying it? Well, and how many and likes then, and views do that fucking video have? Right. I have no idea. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's a performative aspect as there is with with almost with almost anything these days. And the other thing I worry about, and I've been talking for us, I'll stop, is how much it is the self-perpetuating slash uh, prophecy, self-prophecy fulfilling of grievance studies and gen- or, and mm. uh, you know, women's ideology. You know, first wave feminism was great. Women needed the right to vote to be seen as equal citizens. Second wave, even great, you, you know, still pretty great. You know, equality in the workplace, lack of, you know, just anti-discrimination laws, sexual harassment laws. And then they got mad that hot girls go on the cover of Maxim because they needed something to continue to be mad about. And that's true of almost all grievance studies. They never actually accomplish the goal they say they want to, because then everybody would be out of a fucking job. So I wonder how much this ideology being perpetuated about this zero sum game, about this anti-male or about this competition between the sexes is just because there's a lot of gender studies professors who don't want to be out of a job. Yeah. It, it seems like a lot of very bitter people who are genuinely very bitter Mm -hmm. have been very influential on people who aren't as bitter and have this innocent core to them, but who then sort of perform bitterness because that's the kind of trendy thing to do. I think you made a really interesting point about how genuine and sincere this is. And you have to hope that it's not particularly genuine, that it's sort of a front. Uh, and I think it speaks to the saying, I want to say it was George Carlin, but I can't remember exactly who, but he said, behind every cynic is a disappointed idealist. Yeah. And I bring this up because I think at their core, most women and actually men, I think men get really unfairly um, treated on on this topic. Uh, They get sort of misrepresented. I think most women and men are actually quite romantic at heart. They really, there's something very primordial and, and, and true just, just on a base level on like a metaphysical level about wanting a wonderful man or woman in your life, wanting a beautiful princess, wanting a handsome prince. Like I think that's how most people feel. So when I say behind every cynic is a disappointed idealist, I think that everyone is sort of putting on this very cynical front, including a lot of people who are, you know, Andrew Tate fans or whatever. But deep down, they just really want one person who loves them. If you're a man, they're going to emphasize, obviously, that is attractive, that is sexually attractive to them and women to to a lesser extent as well. Um, And and I think that a lot of these people post, like you said, how much they hate men or women on Twitter or whatever. And they may go home and actually show a lot of kindness and 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 humanity towards someone of the opposite sex. But another thing they might do, because most of these people who I think are posting this don't have families or don't have positive relationships with the opposite sex. Yeah. I think what they're doing is they're going home to their lonely existence, but then they are pining for like that that exception to the rule. They want to be wrong. I think mm-hmm. these people want to be wrong, and that's the sad part of it. And I'll say that I can totally relate to that. Like I've I've shared on the channel that I was an incel until 23, and I never wore it on my sleeve too much because I knew how bad that would be for me socially. I didn't lean into incel culture and incel ideology. I didn't advertise that in my commentary at any point, even at the height of my feelings, because I did have these feelings that were resentful towards women. That is a very natural consequence of being an incel. That's that's like totally inevitable. If you're an incel, there's going to be a little part of you that resents women for not having sex with you. It's just part of the experience of being a man who can't get laid. Um, and hopefully you don't, you know, do anything, you know, you don't go fucking Elliot Rogers on anybody or anything like that. Um, and I certainly didn't. Uh, and I know that my incel dumb, a lot of people would be like 23, that's nothing, but like, that's pretty old. Uh, and, and so I bring this up because I definitely will say from my experience that I didn't wear it on my sleeve too much publicly. But I did have these very conflicting feelings about women where on one hand, of course, there's a little part of my young teenage self or early 20s self who's like, fucking bitches are so hard to fucking understand. I don't fucking right. get it. Why can't I get fucking laid? And, you know, I was very young at the time. And so that's kind of my inner monologue. It sounds like Eric Cartman or something, <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, but, but I also, there was a part of me every time I was thinking that also saying like, I just want a beautiful, nice caring yeah. woman in my life. I just want, and I, I envisioned that it was a real thing that I could find this, this wonderful princess. And I think women 
who are thought of as the more inherently romantic sex. Although I don't know if that's necessarily true. There's really interesting content about that. But women who are thought of that way, I think also they'll be like fucking men and they're fucking bullshit. But I think there's always a part of them that wants Prince Charming to show up and that believes that can happen. Uh, And if if they can't, that's even sadder. I, I, I guess I hope we're right that there aren't actually people that are like, Ev- absolutely every one of the opposite sex because this is the way they frame it and you hope that they're putting on a front but you hope that there's no one who actually believes that like every one of the opposite sex is a scumbag and that it's not worth engaging with them and i i do wonder about that because at least then there's hope that you could sort of work with that like okay this person at their core still has these very sort of classical romantic desires and we can use that to kind of fix the situation because then everybody wants the same thing. Like these people want what we want, right? Mm-hmm. But if people really just want to harm the other sex because they're actually that bitter and they don't believe in love, they don't believe in any kind of harmonious possible relationship between them and a person of the opposite sex, I don't know what the fuck we do with that. And I think there are at least a, a very small minority of people who are like that, who are just deeply, deeply unwell and, and just want the worst for the opposite sex. Yeah. I mean, first, a lot of that discussion, I'd like to call back to our warning last week about the whatever podcast. The women that are on there are not stereotypes about women. I can only imagine generally resentful dudes watching that and just thinking, well, I'm totally fucking right about how they're dumb about this. Like, so we warned you last week, don't watch whatever and think that's how women think. Um, But it's so interesting because I, the the quote, the Carlin quote or whoever it is, you know, behind every cynic is a disciplined romantic or whatever. You know, I do wonder how, uh, how many um, behind every red, like super red pill, like men's right advocates (laughs) guy, there used to be a nice feminist. There was actually a disappointed, nice feminist guy. Um, (laughs) You know, because they were rejected a handful of, of, of times by girls who ended up fucking some guy they thought had toxic masculinity. I, I think that's a lot of that movement is just, you know, because in, in, you know, it's a really fascinating thing you said is I wonder if Disney fucked us up a little bit, like in the sense of like Disney taught me that, you know, if you're that nice, nice guy who's there and is the beck and call and is sensitive and compliment, you know, that, that you're the prince and you're the girl that everybody wants. And then you are that guy for some girl. And after the second glass of wine, she has to go because she's got to go on a date with a guy who you think is toxic. Um, so I think that's a super big motivation behind a lot of the MRA stuff is just, you know, nice feminist dudes who are disappointed. And for the most part these days, at least on like some of the TikTok stuff I've done, um, your former guest, Brad Palumbo, has a new podcast where he does like woke TikToks. When dudes get on there and get on the feminists, they are not nice feminist guys. They are seem like total fucking dicks. They are mean human beings. So, um. <clears throat> Yeah, it's so I do think that a lot of disappointment goes comes into the resentment between men and women and from the idea of as the movie 40 year old virgin put it of putting pussy on the pedestal um, and then being disappointed by it and thinking that the world is unfair because that's what you were told what to do. And now these horrible women won't do it. And, you know, you go to the other side with women, how much of them is a reaction against trauma, against bad relationships, so that it, it, it is really hard to set what say what can reconcile these things when you've got to a, at least a somewhat significant minority of probably both sides coming from a place of trauma and resentment. Yeah, there was what you said about sort of like film propaganda, particularly whether it's Disney or even like the Adam Sandler movies of kind of like you're the schlubby, lovable Jewish yeah. guy or whatever. It's it's hard to separate Adam Sandler from the, the Jewishness, but um, I say as a Jew. But uh, in any case, it, if you're sort of the schlubby, lovable, dorky guy that they, they always portrayed it as like you will probably find yourself in these sort of humiliating situations at first – but then like over time, girl, women will come around and like you you will ultimately get the girl at the end. I think that's kind of how it was always portrayed. And that's – there's a kernel of truth to that insofar that obviously as you get older, women will look for guys that give them more of a sense of stability. Um, so like there's – it's no wonder that I lost my – virginity and, and, and had my first serious girlfriend when I was 23, which is around the age that I think men and women both start to have like a little bit of consciousness of like, okay, I'm an adult. I'm not in college anymore. 
Uh, so like stuff like that, I, I sort of understand, but what the, the bad message that you're getting there is this idea that you should be the, just the nice dorky, lovable guy. And that if you pray, portray yourself as this like overtly innocent, which you're not again, that's disingenuous. Men want to fuck, like, especially young men, 21 year olds, like you're, you're sort of denying this reality mm -hmm. of what you are. Cause men are, what are we? We break shit. We have sex. We eat a lot. Like you sort of extricate that from your public image for women. And, and they'll see you as just like this nice, innocent guy that they want to deflower or something. And that's where the, a lot of the weird like Michael Sarah and Jesse Eisenberg style films where yeah, it was yeah. like, here's this twitchy virgin who's really cute and kind of dorky and funny and awkward. And he's humiliated for maybe the first like 45 minutes of the movie. And then towards the end, he gets the girl. Who's right, always he kills some, a bunch of zombies and gets yeah up yeah and, stone. yeah and and even there at least with, with, if it's a movie like Zombieland's a good example because at least there he learns to be a little self sufficient he does kill some zombies right there's a, some movies would take a little more of the direction of like because the direction I want to go with this is Jordan Peterson says don't be harmless and don't be completely you know chaotically dangerous be dangerous in a very sort of uh, controlled way. Like choose mm -hmm. when you're dangerous, show a woman that you can be dangerous when you need to be. And right. so the example of like Zombieland or a movie like that is interesting because usually those guys, they show courage. A lot of these movies it did at least do that. They would, the guy has to do something brave. He has to do something where he isn't a dork, where he isn't mm -hmm. a fucking pussy. <laughs> like he has to do something where he shows that. So sometimes there was that message, which isn't the worst because then the woman was reacting to the fact that like, oh, this dorky guy who I always friend zoned finally did something brave and sort of came out of his shell. So that's not the worst version of it. Um, but there are other versions of it where it was just like, be a completely harmless, or you know what it is actually, to be fair, I think most movies did make that character do something. Now that I think about it, they had to do something brave or manly. I think a lot of guys just got the wrong message out of it because mm. so much of the content of the runtime of the film was focused on just like, look how harmless and naive and innocent this guy is. Yeah. Look how good he, look how kind he is. Because the, these are always very intrinsically good characters, right? Your Jesse Eisenberg, Michael Sarah types. They're good guys, nice guys. Um, and I think that guys just sort of like, they didn't pay attention to that last moment where it's like, oh, this person actually has agency, does something brave, does something dangerous or violent even. Uh, is protective of a woman, do, finally does something masculine, uh, follows the Jordan Peterson edict of be dangerous when it counts, be dangerous mm -hmm. in a way that is righteous or controlled or or particularly tact, you know, tactical. Um, so this is a really interesting point where I feel like guys just got this messaging where like they almost got it. Like, like yes, yeah. you should try to be a good person. You should be somewhat chivalrous towards women. That's good. But you can't just be this like, completely harmless pussy <laughs> like that's not right, that's right, not right. like don't just lean into that jesse eisenberg michael Sarah thing remember the part where they shoot the zombie with a shotgun like you got to get to that point yeah. i have a close friend who i don't think he deploys this strategy anymore but he used to he's like you kind of want to give the impression of a girl that you're an asshole to everybody but her and i don't know how good <laughs> of advice that is because if you just treat everybody like shit except for that one person i i guess there's a message being sent there but not not particularly one i would recommend but you know that that jordan peterson point reminds me of like you hear like joe rogan talk about this a lot like the people who are the best fighters in the world are the people not getting in fights now there's a lot of re the reasons for that but they don't need to show that off unless it really counts like they'll obviously be able to defend themselves but that's the kind of thing is having the strength courage bravery whatever to inside of you when it's needed but to throw that around all the time makes it seem less cool and it just ends up making you a douchebag yeah i think this the the strategies of like i think for a while there was there was a brief moment before the term negging had kind of been well understood and mutually understood by men and women where it did work a little bit uh, mm. and there was even a time i think particularly between like 20 uh, 13 and 2017, like at the, at the, during kind of the, the height of the sort of feminist Cambrian explosion where people hadn't really caught on to the male feminist kind of snaky way of getting laid. Um, and I think it did work a little for a while. People wouldn't have done it if it didn't work at all. I think that one of the reasons, uh, that I keep talking about how I thought we were past that time though, is because that doesn't work anymore. I, I think there was definitely a moment where women started to really recognize and it kind of became a meme, the male feminist who wants to get laid. And a big part of that, by the way, was a lot of male feminist types. It turned out they were abusing or sexually harassing women. And that would come out 
often of these like socialist mm-hmm. guys, these guys at the DSA with their mustaches who are like, yeah, I'm a labor organizer. And it turns out they're a cashier at Redner's or whatever, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and they who, drive a Porsche right, and they masturbate to extremely degrading pornography for 16 hours a day. <laughs> you know, sure. like, it, it's like, it, it's like, that that meme of like that kind of person started to become well, very well understood. You could recognize that very quickly. I think of like the comedian uh, Jake Flores as like the kind of the quintessential, like he, he's a guy that uh, Nick Mullen had a feud with at some point. Anyway, okay. um, if you look up Jake Flores, he's who I envision when I think of this sort of like nice guy, feminist DSA type. Um, he has a inter- interesting things that I don't think I can talk about on the show that have occurred in his past. But uh, in any case... Up. Um, yeah, to be careful what you look up with Jake Flores. <laughs> don't go to any images. D- don't, uh, do that. Good to know. Um, so <laughs> no that's for the audience too, is to be very notes. careful for Jake Flores when you're Googling him. Um, but yeah, he, he's just, you know, one of these guys that he still to this day goes on about like, I'm such a feminist, like anti-racist and that I think. I think that and then also one of the few positives I think of sort of the Andrew Tate manosphere, great awakening of, 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 you know, based men or, you know, gamers rise up, whatever you want to fucking call it of the last like two or three years. One of the few positives I think is that men are at least getting this idea that they should. I think Andrew Tate is at least able to give them the idea of like, cause he, what is he? He's an MMA fighter. He's in really good shape. He, he could kick somebody's ass. He's at least giving them a little bit of an idea of like, don't be the harmless pussy. He may not be telling them to be a, 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 a you know, a nice good person who is right. tactful with their violence. Uh, you know, he's obviously encouraging men to be sort of like uh, players, you know, constantly running game and fucking as many chicks as possible. Not the best message to send in Don't my opinion. That. Yeah. But at least it's not the fucking Michael Sarah, like just be a harmless pussy thing. Right. So we we seem to have moved past that. I think that only really, really, naive men who just aren't like aren't up to speed on these things are still doing that but now we're sort of in this place where it's all about game and fucking as many chicks as possible and being a perpetual 19 year old and never growing past that again look honestly if you're i would say if you're 19 some of the advice andrew tate is giving you is probably much more valuable than if you're 29 like Mm -hmm. it's just it's just weird that he's i think he's in like his mid 30s so that's one of the main reasons i'm so critical of him is that i think he's I don't know. He he just he's always encouraging people to act like they're teenagers, even though. And the, the thing is, that strategy is just not going to work for most men. I they, they talk. I, I've heard them talk about this. I think on whatever is like it's only like the top five percent of men who are able to really be promiscuous like that with you know whatever per, you know with eights and above or sevens and above whatever. So you're almost certainly you're not in the demographic that's not going to be able no. to do that. And if you are. It's not a good idea, but but let's go ahead and put put to bed the idea that, you know, I'll go ahead and shit on myself. Me looking type of dudes. Yeah, no, I don't care how much game I have. I'm not just going to go out. I mean, again, engaged, but I, I'm not going to be out and just go <laughs> scoring every weekend. And I have a lot of empirical evidence to back up that claim. Yeah, but that's that's the thing is that, I mean, you're engaged. I'm uh, it, I've been in a relationship for many, many years, uh, you know, heading in a really good direction. It's like. You can have that thing that I think most men want at their core. I, most men, I think, are, I think women think of men as like they really, really want to. Just, I guess when you're really, really young, you do kind of have this. Although this might be porn brain talking. I, I've talked on the show before about how I had a porn addiction problem for many years through my teenage years. So I think porn brain gave me a little bit of that. I want to fuck every girl in the world yeah. and be a rock star who has groupies lining up to do X, Y, and Z. But as you get older, and especially because I've stopped watching pornography, I've realized like at the core, men want one woman who they are attracted to. That's really important. You should be, you want to, you have to, you can't just be some hag that you're not attracted to. So that's absolutely true. Men don't like fat, ugly women. It's just just reality. But at the end of the day, men aren't quite as um, promiscuously minded, I think, as a lot of women think, especially once they mature past like college. I think men who are at least through that time when you're just surrounded by – because college and high school is also like – your hormones are exploded. You're surrounded by women who are expressing their sexuality for the first time, who are discovering the power in their mm-hmm. sexuality for the first time and they're intoxicated by it. There's no regulating force of like having a job, having a 40 hour work week, having adult responsibilities. 
There's very little permanence in that lifestyle. Everything is temporary. You know, yeah. you take this class for a semester, you work this job just to make money for your money. There's not a lot of permanence. And so relationships are kind of hard because relationships are meant to be, at least in the end, a permanent thing. Yeah. And everyone knows going into college, it's like just short enough that you can kind of see the end of the tunnel, even on your first day of freshman year. It's four years long. You're like, mm-hmm. it's four years long. It's, it's not. And especially once you get past the first couple of years, once you're a sophomore, it's like, okay, I've got like, what, two, two and a half years left. Like it, again, that sense of, uh, uh, of, of, of it being so ephemeral, I think that's a really good point. Um, so again, a, a lot of the things that people say online that are sort of misandrist or misogynistic or just very cynical, there's like a kernel of truth there, but it, that kernel is much more so for people who are in college or high school than they are for people who are adults. And so I just worry about people who don't know that you not only shouldn't lean too heavily into that mindset in high school and college when you can kind of get away with it, um, but you really have to grow out of it. And people see Andrew Tate and it's like, he's not 23, he's he's like 35 years old. And so I, I don't think they're getting it. And he's certainly not portraying it that way. He's portraying it as like, I am the alpha, I am the best possible way to be as a man. (laughs) Um, and I, I think that the decline of Peterson, uh, as an influential figure has been a disaster in this area. It's really unfortunate that Peterson's kind of cooked. I I don't watch a whole lot of his content anymore. And I just, I don't know, even though I actually, I don't think that he's like not a good commentator anymore. Every time I go to watch one of his videos now, I go like, oh, there's still something here. Like this is interesting stuff, but the vitality of his commentary really disappeared when he had his health problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, his prolonged absence, uh, and then him coming back and just not being quite the same. Um, the crying, which I did find rather endearing about Peterson actually at first, got to be a little excessive at one point. It, it just got to be a little strange because he started mm. crying in almost like every other interview he gave. And it just made me feel kind of worried about him. I I hate the fact that he sort of went away to an extent or at least isn't as influential as he was because I think he really struck a good balance in – telling men in a very sophisticated way how to be yeah. and encouraging them to be masculine and to be strong, but in a very mature and refined way because he's a married 60-year-old man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I had 12 rules. I mean, each one of those, I, I actually- They're great. I don't know if I've read 12 rules all the way through, but the whole idea of having your shit together doesn't require you to have a harem in Romania. It doesn't require you to buy expensive cars and to be a total fucking douchebag. All it requires is you to be a good actualized person who other good actualized persons want to be around, whether that be friends, a romantic relationship, whatever. Is I, I he, he put up just this kind of basic idea of just be a good person who can stand up for themselves, who can be productive and is confident in themselves. And that's really all the advice people need. We don't need to keep going on, here's how you have the riz to be able, did I use that right? To uh, to be able <laughs> to so. pick up at the at the college <laughs> bar on Saturday night. Like, no, that's there's so many things wrong with that. Just just be a decent actualized person who makes their bed in the morning. Yeah. And it's, it's great. And, and, you know, and the fact that he always did emphasize, like you should have a person, you should try to have a girlfriend or a wife or something like you should aspire to have a monogamous relationship. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you don't want to be perpetually single. You don't want to be an incel. You don't want to be uh, a player. Like that's something that he was never in favor of. Um, you know, Peterson always just gave very practical advice. I remember he used to just say like, have some friends, get your social life in order Uh, have a woman in your life and have like a decent job and you're like 90% of the way there. Like you're good. And I kind of put that together in my life around the time that he was at his height. I found the girl that I'm, I'm with to this day. I got, you know, I started a career that's been fairly lucrative for me financially. Um, I, you know, developed a strong friend group in in the city where I live with people who have the same ideals of me as as me. And I really sought that out actively because that's hard to do when you're not in college anymore. And I was not at the time. And I got to say that like Peterson's prescription for male success is very true. And and the video where I saw him say that, by the way, was in response to somebody talking to him about mental illness. And it's really interesting because he was saying so many people who, who say that they're depressed, you say like, okay, well, maybe you are depressed. Maybe you have a chemical imbalance. Maybe you're clinically depressed, but let's, let's look at some other possibilities. How's your, do you have a, a girlfriend or a significant other? No. Do you have uh, friends? Maybe one or none? Okay. That's not great. 
uh, do you have a job or a job that you uh, that is relatively lucrative or that you enjoy? No. Okay, your life is completely in shambles. <laughs> like if you have zero right. out of three of those things, uh, it's like you, you're not. No wonder you're depressed. Yeah. It's like you're not depressed. Your life sucks. Your life sucks. Right. That's and that's and that's and that's a thing that you obviously have to address at the core instead of addressing the symptoms of like I feel depressed. I feel sad about it. And that's a really good message for men and women. Because one of the things I wanted mm-hmm. to talk about on the show today, I've been talking about men for a while, and I do want to talk specifically about are women okay? Because there's some really interesting stuff going on with Britney Spears that I want to get into. Uh, it's all like late 90s nostalgia today. We'll talk about Barbie, and then we'll talk about Britney <laughs> Spears for a bit. Um, very like uh, talking about talking about big titty blondes today, but in a, in a, yeah, in a different so. kind of way. Um, <laughs> I don't know how big her breasts were. I don't remember. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Britney Spears, I want to talk about for a bit. And then also I want to talk about mental illness for a second, since we were just talking about that with Peterson and with men. Because when I think about women and the sort of the gender wars today, I think about how it seems like for men, depression as a mental illness is very romanticized. And you're kind of encouraged to lean into this, like, I'm in my depression nest. I have depression. That's part of my sort of like darkly Kurt Cobain-esque, you know, appeal as like a as like a tortured artist, even though these are people who often don't make art or content. And for women, anxiety is kind of your mental illness of the week, kind of your cause celebrate mental illness. It's like I have anxiety. I lean into my anxiety and it makes me kind of this childlike being who needs to be constantly catered to and treated with kid gloves because I'm just so riddled with anxiety. Like when I walk into a room of people I don't know, there's so many girls I've talked to that say this, they walk into a room with people they don't know and they're just riddled with anxiety. And it's like, that's a really basic life skill. I don't know. (laughs) Like that's, you're going to have to get over that. So I want to talk about mental illness for a bit because I, I think that there are these romanticized mental illnesses that really got romanticized. I think between the time that Kurt Cobain took his own life Uh, Because he's this really interesting figure. He made this really great music. And I always feel like that was sort of around the time that Kurt Cobain kind of became the OG like depression legend. (laughs) Like, because he's such a cool guy. Like, I like Kurt Cobain. I like Nirvana a lot. And I, I really do appreciate what he was. But there's also been this romanticization of him as like this legendary, almost mythical creature because he died at his zenith by doing something very sad, which was, uh, I think you can say taking your own life. People have been saying unaliving yourself which is that's the nonsense. worst, but, uh, but I know you can't say the S word, so I'll yeah. try not to so that the YouTube doesn't take down the video. But you know, when he did that, I think that he sort of started this reflection on figures like that, especially as the internet started to become a thing shortly after his, his death, where he became kind of almost this weird aspirational figure for men. And it's like, there are little aspects of Kurt Cobain that you can aspire to. He was a rock star. He was a great artist. But to aspire to live like him or to have his vibe, to have his his vibe is not good. <laughs> he was a deeply depressed heroin addict who took his own life. And, and, and you know, like, so anyway, I think it started there. I, th- I feel like that is always where I feel like this sort of romanticization of mental illness started and then, you know, there are movies like Garden State and a lot of movies in the early aughts that kind of continue to romanticize mental illness. And just like Kurt Cobain, I like the movie Garden State. Not all of these things are bad, but I think it made a lot of people be like, I want to have this sort of Zach Braff, you know, looking directly into the camera with a sort of Wes Anderson style symmetrical framing. Kurt Cobain with his, you know, deep blue eyes staring off in the distance during MTV Unplugged. They want to yeah, have Donnie this. Darko in a way. Donnie Darko is a great example. And I love Donnie Darko. Like these I aren't bad Darko. movies. It's not yeah. bad art, but it really gave people again, kind of like we were talking about before with the Michael Sarah harmless pussy virgin thing. People took the wrong message out of it, which is don't aspire to be these people. Take the lessons away of how not to be like this. You yeah. don't want to be Zach Braff, who's like this completely unfeeling, broken person in Garden State. You don't want to be Donnie Darko, who has all sorts of issues. I haven't seen the movie in a long time. Yeah, you don't want to be schizophrenic. You don't want to be Kurt Cobain, who does the most awful thing that a person could do to themselves. And so I, I feel like from there, we ended up in a place where, especially in the 2010s with the, with social media starting to proliferate, you really saw people wearing mental illness as a badge of honor. And mm-hmm. uh, and again, trying to sort of hit that Kurt Cobain, Donnie Darko sweet spot where they could be 
that they could have a sort of mental illness aesthetic almost, a mental illness vibe that would gain them social currency. And victimhood culture is a part of this too, because mental illness is a way to 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 gain the currency of victimhood culture. So I just I bring this all up when we're talking about the gender wars because I feel like it's a very gendered thing now. Men have a tendency, I think, to lean into depression, women anxiety. And real quick before Ben jumps in, I just do want to say, because I realize I should give this disclaimer, people have mental illnesses. I think mental oh, illnesses yeah. are overdiagnosed. I do not think they are non-existent. I just want to emphasize that. I'm not like a mental illness denier. I'm not coming to you on the show today to say that nobody has depression or anxiety. I have a mental illness myself. I have OCD. Uh, people have mental illnesses. I think they are... There are far more people who think they have mental illness today who probably don't, hearkening back to their life just sucks, uh, and that they're being overdiagnosed and self-diagnosed in many cases. And that's what I want to talk about because I think it's a big part actually of what is driving men and women apart because it's causing them to uh, to, to to be underdeveloped emotionally. I think that sort of incorporating into your identity, I am a depressed man or I am an anxious woman stunts you emotionally. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot in there. Uh, so first I think that some of the fetishization of figures like, so my Kurt Cobain is David Foster Wallace who wrote oh, yeah. infinite jest. Mm -hmm. He killed himself. Um, you know, but part of it is it, it, people with mental illnesses kind of think, I mean, I hate to use this cliche, like outside the box, they're generally more creative. Like a lot of very, very uh, talented musicians, authors, artists have something wrong with them. And that whatever was wrong with them allowed them to create beautiful music or beautiful writing or whatever. So it's sometimes hard to disentangle uh, ha having an admiration for the talent, but also like if, if some if certain artists didn't have whatever illnesses they had, they probably wouldn't have been awesome. So it's it that is kind of a bit difficult to disentangle. But I, I couldn't agree with you more about the over medicalization, the over uh, sci, you know diagnosis of mental illness. It's like I feel bad. Oh well, you have depression. I mean, we can and we have tried to pull ourselves away from kind of the political stuff. It's the same thing with the gender ideology stuff. Is I'm feeling anxious about something. Well, do you think it's your gender? All right, well here's some puberty blockers. I, I know I'm oversimplifying, but you know it's the same thing of just like people go in and they have normal human life problems like anxiety and we decide to give them pills. Like I had took Paxil when I was a freshman in high school and I remember going through all that and I remember thinking like, you know what, if I get diagnosed with depression, then it's not my fault. It's something wrong with me and then I can take the pill and it'll be better. When in reality, it was, I just was sad because of, first of all, just being a normal teenager, but of different consequences of things in my life. But, but the ability to ex almost externalize is a weird thing to say about something going on inside of you, but to kind of externalize the circumstances of your life into a category of anxiety, depression, clinical depression, bipolar, all these different things um, is a way to kind of say, listen, this isn't my fault. This is some disease that I have, um, which even if that's true, let, let's just assume that is true. That does not in any way uh, mitigate your responsibility to deal with that yourself. Like you mentioned, you know, an OCD thing, like you still have to live a normal life. Like there was a, there was a popular, uh, TikTok video going around about a girl who said she uh, she had been diagnosed with or diagnosed herself with time blindness. Oh God! And yeah, that, that she went to an interview and asked them about you know whether it was uh, incumbent on her if, for if she took this job to be on time, and she said she had problems with that because of her time blindness. And when they had the normal employer reaction of uh, yeah, you got to be on time, she went and cried on TikTok about how she was being discriminated against because of her disability. Um, so this fetishization of mental illness to these new things that don't can't possibly exist, but let's even assume that time blindness is a real symptom of some mental illness. You're still incumbent on you to set a few more iPhone alarms yeah. to, to check, to get a watch. Like you have to still be a normal functioning, uh, member of society, even though you may have mental illnesses. And I couldn't agree with you more. The, the over self-diagnosis, the, the, and then I, I will not go into all the conspiracy theories I could possibly have <laughs> about how pharmaceuticals and the medical industry perpetuates this to make money. But yeah, it, it is definitely a problem and causes conflict with people and between the sexes. 
I love that you brought up that it's a crisis of responsibility because I felt that way for a long time. It is absolutely a way to absolve yourself of responsibility for certain ways that you act. Like if you if you say you have anxiety and then you walk into a room and you're kind of a nervous mess, instead of saying like, okay, I have to learn how not to do this, you just go, oh, well, I have anxiety. This is a disease. And I really mm-hmm. just need people to cater to my disease. The way that the, people do cater to physical diseases, if somebody is in a wheelchair and they say, hey, can you help me get through this door? I can't open this by myself. Any normal, decent person is like, yeah, of course, let me help you with that. And so I think mental illness gives people the idea of like, I can have a disease and illness. I can be treated the way that disabled people are, physically disabled people, or people mm-hmm. who are literally intellectually disabled, which is thankfully as a society, we treat those people very nicely and we give them a lot of leeway and things that we don't give anyone else. And it's it's weirdly attractive in a way in a victimhood culture, unfortunately. People want a piece of that pie. And it's really, I can only imagine how disturbing it is to people with actual like deep illnesses. I mean, I have OCD, oh, yeah. but to someone who has like terrible schizophrenia and has to live with that their whole life, it's like, fuck you for appropriating this. I can only imagine mm-hmm. how annoying it is. Um, because, and you know, and I, I guarantee you, if Kurt Cobain, you know, a few hours before he did what he did, could tell you, he'd be like, don't be like me. Like right. Kirk Cobain didn't want people to be like him. I guarantee you, he was not wishing for other people to emulate their lives after him, unless he really resented others, which I, I don't think he did. He had other issues. Um, it's just, it's unfortunate. And the point about responsibility is such a good one. I think that particularly with women, feminist ideology in recent years has really been built around abdication of responsibility. You are never responsible for your actions, for your promiscuity, for your uh, anything you do that makes men uninterested in you is their fault. It's because the men are bad. It's because the patriarchy made them bad. And I think that 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 abdication of responsibility is coupled with mental illness culture because you can just say everything is because the patriarchy and my anxiety and it's this form of arrested development and underdevelopment that leads to women in their 30s and 40s acting like they're in their late teens or early 20s. And it's a really sad thing to see and you will see it. And I mean, it gets sad quickly, by the way. It gets sad when you're in like your mid 20s. Like that gets old fast. That got old for mm. me fast. I started encountering women uh, in my, my even my, my sort of like early mid 20s. Once I was like out of college, it was like, I can't be around people who just are, are so steeped in everything being uh, the fault of some, you know, political persecutory group like the patriarchy or, um, or you know, mental illness. And I, I do want to get into somebody who has sort of been a case study in mental illness for, you know, the better part of 25 years now, which is Britney Spears. Um, there was a really, really interesting post on Twitter about Britney Spears that I'm going to bring up for myself and I'll try to put it on the screen as well for the audience. Um, and it's this, it's from a guy named Bjorn Iron Skull, somebody I follow on Twitter. Don't know a whole lot about him. Can't remember why I followed him, but he said something really interesting about the mental instability of Britney Spears. Um, if you don't know, and I will try to put at least a screen cap of one of the videos, uh, into the videos that you can see. And I, I guess I encourage you, if you want to understand this conversation better to look up the Instagram of Britney Spears. I say it with hesitation because Britney Spears is extremely mentally unwell. And this has been well documented for like 20 years now. Um, She famously had a mental breakdown circa 2006 where she shaved her head and broke a paparazzi's window with an umbrella. Um, And she uh, has also for the better part of like two or three years now been posting a lot of things on Instagram that can only be described as like schizo posting as like absolutely bizarre manic posts, uh, a lot of which used to feature these walls of text of just kind of like generically inspirational stuff. And then Mm. now it's leaned more into these videos of her very awkwardly dancing in very, very skimpy clothing, uh, like maybe bikini bottoms, like cheeky bikini bottoms and a tube top or something. And she also has this very manic expression in her eyes whenever she does this. She has a crazed expression in her eyes. And I want to talk about this in in the frame of what Bjorn Ironskull on Twitter here uh, said about it, which was Britney Spears has proven to be this interesting mirror that no one realizes is a mirror. Her behavior isn't really that different from a lot of women on social media, yet for her we ask, is she okay, while dismissing the millions of others? And this is juxtaposed with he's posting one of these videos where Britney is 
dancing provocatively. Brittany is a 41-year-old woman, by the way. This is a very strange thing for a 41-year-old to be doing. I know this is relatively common, but that's kind of the point of the post is that a lot of women do like 80% of what Brittany is doing. Like it, it may be a little less awkward when it's a younger woman, a woman who is not a mom of two the way that Brittany is. Um, and also Brittany has the underlying discomfort that comes from knowing that this is a celebrity who was, you know, uh, the world's leading sex symbol and pop star for many years, well past her prime, clearly sort of hearkening for the adoration that she received uh, for her sexuality and for her uh, ability to dance and sing and all of that. And it's, <laughs> I, can see, I can see Ben is is looking at some of this for the first time. It's so, so for people, you have to look it up. I think you might have a hard time understanding what we're about I to talk about. If, if you don't see it for yourself, Ben was making a face because he was making, he was making a funny face because you watch these videos and it's like, it's, it's, it is the definition of like something you can't look away from like a train wreck. It is like, what is happening here? So I wanted to talk about this in sort of the frame that Bjorn Iron Skull pull it because, put it because yes, Britney Spears is a older, she's a middle-aged woman, 41. She's a aging pop star. There's a lot to di to dissect when it comes to her. And we can get into that a little bit as sort of, she's a, a case study and a very real, very obvious female mental illness. Um, but I do think that I don't want to get away from the point that was made in the tweet, which is a lot of women actually post content that is pretty gosh darn similar to this, like on mm. TikTok or whatever. And it's not always women who are monetizing it very well. Yeah. Sometimes it's some e-girl who's making, you know, uh, 10,000 uh, bucks per video, like Charlie D'Amelio or whatever. She makes more than that. She probably makes like a hundred thousand bucks per video. But sometimes it's some woman where you're like, oh, she's got like 30 followers. Like she's doing this because she wants to. She's got these videos of herself dancing provocatively. They make the weird e-girl faces, which are kind of deranged and demonic when you really think about it. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about this, Ben. I don't know what you make of that tweet, but I really, that, that was like the best tweet I'd seen in a long time. I was like, this tweet really cuts to the core of something because also the Britney Spears thing has been so sort of darkly in a very dark way, fascinating to behold. Yeah, the the Britney thing. It, there's so much I think to talk about with Britney Spears because, I mean, you thrust because her popularity coincided with kind of like the rise of the internet, right? So like you could have been famous before, but there was only like, and I guess she got to that point, but she got famous when you could broadcast everything like immediately and instantaneously. So. <clears throat> It's a weird situation because she became so famous at such a young age at a time when she could be more famous than almost anyone ever had been because of the reach of, of the Internet. So the effects that that would have even on a completely sane, grounded person, it, it, it's hard to even imagine what that that life is like. Um, I think it's totally true that she's probably not well, either because of just that or that in combination with some type of underlying mental illness. Um, and yeah, the videos are, it's, it's that the eye, it, it, I, so they're, I think the they're, they're like, they're like if somebody made a horror movie and this is a yeah. scene from a horror movie. I mean, they're really horrific to watch actually. Yeah. So this, this uh, Bjorn Iron Skull, who I hadn't heard of where you sent it to me, one of the tweets that really kind of caught my eye in this thread is that we see Britney Spears and still see an 18 year old, but an 18 year old from a world where selling your nudes online the day you turned 18 would be atrocious. An 18 year old time from a time when children having fame without celebrity would be weird and concerning. And I've thought about that for about an hour now. And I, I there is something there, something strange about the fact that it's, it's this remnant of someone like, let, let's be real here. Middle school, wanted fucking nothing more than to see Britney Spears naked. And now all of the the girls who are so super famous of this time, maybe not super famous, but like famous enough to have, you know, 100K plus on Twitter, you can see them naked. And so, it, it, and it's weird to put that this kind of, I don't want to call Britney Spears a re, like relic is a, is a demeaning term. That's not what I mean. But like this person from a time past when that was all everybody wanted in a world where it seems so easy to get that access. There, there's an incongruity here that makes you that that maybe is explains why I think it's so weird to see Britney dancing now. It however old she is, um, 
in a bikini in her house. Can I, and I'll also mention, I just don't think her dance moves are popping as well as they used to. That's that's I another aspect of it is we all know how well she can dance and these dance moves are so <laughs> awkward. It's like a mom awkwardly dancing and it's made much worse by the fact that she's wearing these cheeky bikini bottoms at 41 yeah. years old with two children. So that second tweet that you brought up was something I wanted to talk about too. The, the, the further insight given that um, Brittany... What you said about her coming up at a time with the internet was interesting insofar that, yes, it was a time when the internet was starting to become a thing and she could probably read a lot about what people were saying oh, her yeah, on the internet and not just the newspapers. But it was pre-social media. Social media doesn't really mm -hmm. explode. You don't really get Web 2.0, which is basically Web plus real social media, until like 2007-ish. And at that point, she had already kind of had her mental breakdown. And I think mm -hmm. that what Bjorn is speaking to in that second tweet that was really interesting to me is Brittany went through something that a lot of celebrities, especially uh, celebrities who get famous very young, go through, which is sort of having your development arrested at the age at which you become a superstar because all of a sudden your life is like this fairy tale and you don't have to develop mm -hmm. normally. But again, she did it at a time pre-social media. And so one of the things she doesn't have is Britney was never tutorialized the way that a girl is today in how to not come off as cringeworthy on social media. She doesn't, she's 41 years old. Britney Spears is uh, maybe a millennial, like barely a millennial or might even, even be Gen X. She's like cuspy. She's like almost Gen X. So she's approximately four years older than me. Okay. So she, so Britney Spears is like an much very old millennial slash very young Gen X, like right on the cusp. Mm -hmm. So like, She's somebody who like, she didn't grow up with the, she certainly didn't grow up with the internet and she didn't grow up with social media and she stopped developing before social media was a thing. Women today, they, they're able to do basically what Brittany is doing here, which is dance provocatively and do make weird faces and sort of obsessively post things that are clearly meant to get attention and adoration. Uh, but they know how to do it in a way that's not particularly cringeworthy because they've been tutorialized. They grew up with it. Women have the experiences when they're in middle school now of posting a shitty dance video with a funny face and their friends being like, look at Becky and her stupid fucking video. And then they kind of like learn <laughs> to be like, okay, I got to like dance a little better. Or I got to lose some weight or I got to whatever. And it's, it's nasty and it's, it's, it's mean and it's awful, but it does at least give them this sense of like, okay, the way that you regulate your social media presence in the world is you got to look good in these pictures. You got to look good when you're dancing. You got to, you know, not come off as a cringy, you know, idiot or whatever. Brittany doesn't have that. And she, she, all she's ever had is a bunch of people giving her industrial lighting and makeup and being like, you're a star, you're a star, you're a star, do your thing. You're the, you're the biggest pop star in the world. Everything you do, your, your shit is made of gold. <laughs> like every fucking thing you do is perfect. And she was stopped developing at that point, at a time where there was no social media. It was just that she is the biggest musician in the world. She is America's sweetheart. Uh, she's the sexiest woman in the world. She was the biggest sex symbol in the world from like the year 1999 to like 2009. Uh, maybe not 2000, mm -hmm. 2006 or something, around the time she shaved her head. So, so she was able to keep it going until she lost all her hair. So it, I just found that so interesting because – it's sort of like she is this mirror into if you strip away all of the refinement in what other women are doing and that, okay, they're younger, they're more attractive than a 41-year-old Britney Spears, and they know how to sort of frame it better when they do this stuff. But if you strip that away, they're doing the same thing and it's a sign of maybe not the same degree of unwellness. And it's not as sad because these women are younger. E-girls are generally between the ages of 20 and 30. Um, but – there is still something really weird and and that implies mental unwellness in women, whether they're e-girls or just girls who kind of do this stuff for fun, where they're trying to get this adoration and love that Britney clearly wants. Britney wants to be Britney from 2004. Mm -hmm. But still, there's there's something really interesting in the way Bjorn framed it, where it's like other women are doing this en masse. Brittany is just doing it in a way where she doesn't know how to how to dress it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you also wonder what the effects of like being under that conservatorship, like how uh, sheltered was she during that time? You know, was she real? I, I have no idea. The documentary. There's there a documentary about that. Yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be oh, a no, there one at yeah. some point in time. Yeah. Um, so I'd also be curious about how all of that, it, Britney Spears is a very difficult, uh, 
way to try to to draw anything from other than I think you're you're right about that she's not doing anything different just because of like the confluence of different variables on how she ended up being the way she is. Yeah. And I just, I, I do really worry about women today when I think about the fact that women post the, all these different sort of genres of, I mean, this is sort of like thirst posting. I mean, with Brittany, it's, it's bordering on like schizo posting. It's like, it's really the crazed look in her eyes really. And the, and her age really sells this kind of like, like a person who is mentally dying. And it's very sad. And I actually really wish the best for her. I really hope that she, somebody grabs her and is like, stop doing that. (laughs) That's first step one to recovery for Britney Spears. Stop posting that shit, please. So I wish the best for her, but this genre of sort of like thirst posting is just one of the many ways that women have a tendency to sort of wear their mental issues on their sleeve online. Uh, I mean, women, I, I, I sort of, I wrote down a couple of things in my notes about all the different ways that women sort of advertise extreme mental unwellness on social media. Cause for men, it sort of seems like men's mental illness, it comes out in a very explosive way. It comes out in violence. It comes out in unfortunately like mass shootings and things like that. It comes out in fighting and, and violence and maybe a very overt anger and misogyny Mm -hmm. on the internet with women. It's this more subtle thing where you have the thirst posting, which is very much about wanting attention, uh, from men, but very low resolution attention where there's no risks associated with it. You don't actually have to build a relationship. You can get, you know, 50,000 likes on Instagram for posting a picture of your ass in a bikini. There's what I call I'm baby posting, uh, which is Ben, I'm curious how, if, if, if I'm the only one that's noticed this, this was a little more common when I was in college, but I feel like I still see some women doing it. It's this always portraying yourself in your social media public persona as kind of like a childlike being who is like, I have responsibilities now. How do I adult? Like, and oh, it's yeah. right. And it's, and it's always, and, 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 and sort of dressing and taking pictures of yourself in a way that it's not like the full on like fetishistic age play thing, but it sort of borders on that in this always sort of, uh, speaking from a voice of like a childlike voice in your captions, even of everything is like, how do I adult? And it really comes off like they're trying to deflect the reality of responsibility and adulthood and maintain this sort of childlike status where they don't have to engage with adulthood and the darker parts of human existence. It's a weird thing that women do that doesn't get criticized a lot because it is kind of cute. And if it's a cute girl doing it, you might see it as a relatively innocent thing of just like, this is a girl who just has, you know, a sort of like child core aesthetic, which the more you put it into words, the more strange it sounds. But Um, yeah, I'm going to exit this conversation. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I mean, it's like, do you know do you know what I'm talking about, though? Like, have you I, seen- I do know what you're talking about. I fortunately don't have a lot of that on on my feeds. I I, I get. I think I've been able to avoid it, but I do know that this whole do- idea of adulting super hard, or like, the, I think the common ones I see is like vacation pics, or like, I don't have to adult anymore. I'm in Fiji or whatever. Like, yes, I have seen that. It's almost like a. I see a lot of escape from that. Like, hey, we, we're playing kickball because we're just kids, and I don't have to work today or whatever. Yeah. It's very weird. And it's one of the genres that it's not as common as thirst posting. Thirst posting is like by far one of the most common forms of, especially like Instagram of like female uh, social media engagement. But it's another one that really bothers me. And then, of course, one of the classic things is you see a lot of like political posting, feminist posting. The classic of this is like they go to a protest and they take like 80 million glamour shots of themselves at the protest, (laughs) which you will never, I'm sorry, but you'll never meet a girl who goes to a protest and doesn't take a billion fucking pictures of yourself at the protest. And this always comes off to me as like, these are women who don't feel good about themselves morally. They feel some kind of emptiness or like they've done bad things. And so they lean into ideologies that say that those bad things are okay. Feminism being a big one. Um, anti-racism or Black Lives Matter being a big one. Um, you know, it encourages hatred of cops, hatred of law and order. Uh, and so they lean into these ideologies and then they use engagement with that ideology uh, for social currency online, which makes them feel like, okay, no, I am a good person. Like, see all these people who liked the black square that I posted after George Floyd died? That means I am a good person. And it's, again, men do, with the exception of thirst posting, men do all of these things 
a, a little bit, but they they don't do them as much. And I find, and again, men do other stuff that's really unhealthy. The pornography thing is a much bigger issue for men than it is for women. Um, that's the bad stuff that men are doing on the internet is all the fucking porn that they're watching. Um, but women, they just engage in, it seems like, I guess the reason I'm bringing up all these genres of female posting is Mm -hmm. it seems like 75% (laughs) of the content that I see women posting on social media is this stuff. Like it's not good. I, so I, you made some categories in, in here in our notes. I had a couple to add. Um, first of all, you have the Meghan Markle, uh, which is, posting about some random event in the world and talking about how it represents how oppressed you are. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, you know, it's always patriarchy keeping me down because my, my grass got, it rained. So my grass got higher and I have to mow. So that sort of seems like a somehow. combination of political posting and schizo posting. Yeah. It's like kind of at the cross section of like political posting, but with no connection to reality whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, and to call back a little bit to our discussion of mental illnesses, these people who not only like say they have these mental illnesses, but almost celebrate it on social media. Like, you know, I was going to go to the grocery store, but couldn't because anxiety monsters following me around oh, God, today, yeah. or I don't have enough spoons, which is a whole. There's a whole thing. I think uh, Susie Weiss, which is Barry Weiss's sister, wrote this really long, great piece within the last year about these people that are just like constantly ill, or at least say they are and just can't do anything. But like, yeah, you see a lot of this, like the person who is quote unquote suffering for mental illness, but constantly talking about it, I think is another uh, genre of uh, a female poster that I see. Um, there is one that you had on your list. I don't know if you if you mentioned it. I'm sorry. I skipped one. Um, is the confidence shit. Um, the constant because, inspirational, I, yeah, yeah. Well, more so like the girl boss, boss bitch type of thing, and, and it because I was wondering while I was thinking about this show today of this meme that women say that that dudes don't like confident women, <laughs> and I know that's not true for myself. Like I'm, I'm a lawyer. I work in a profession. There's a lot of established, confident, professional women because part of this job is that's what you have to be, especially if you're like a litigator. So, and I've always found those women attractive, at least that 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 part of them attractive. I'll, I'll, I'll get your opinion on this, but here's what my guess is: is that the kind of women who are like, oh well, you know, dudes just don't like confident women like me, is they're mistaking confidence with being an asshole. And yes, we don't like asshole women, but we, but confident women has never been an issue for me. Yeah. I mean, there's this form of girl boss feminism that encourages you to interrupt men, belittle them, uh, act in a way that is just generally belligerent and unpleasant. And they say, that's you being confident. That's you being, yeah. that's you being a strong, independent whammon. And it's like, right. yeah, if you do that, men aren't going to, I mean, no self-respecting man's going to like you. Maybe a man who has like severe self-esteem issues will be into that, but it's like, yeah, so confidence posting is one that I, I skipped. Um, there's somebody who kind of epitomizes it. I'm just going to drop her name. Ange- Angela Bel Camino, who's this woman who basically, she's in like her late 30s. She might even be 40 at this point. And she posts these videos of herself just like walking down the street in New York City. And she just makes faces at the camera. And then she puts some kind of like completely crazy caption, like walking down the street as a liberal woman in Manhattan is so empowering. All the conservatives can't stop looking at you. That's her most famous one. That's my favorite post like of all time in this genre because it's it's deranged. It's it's absolutely deranged. And the, the it's the juxtaposition of the look on her face, her age, the fact that you can tell she was probably pretty attractive in her younger years and is still like a relatively attractive woman for her age. But it, she doesn't wear this kind of content very well at all at that age. Again, it's like the yeah. Britney Spears thing where it's like a 39-year-old woman should not be posting this. This is bizarre. I, I got to tell you, the most deranged tweet I saw from her, I scrolled down a little bit. The most deranged tweet I saw was this. I honestly think Republicans hate on Hunter Biden because he's handsome and everything they wish they could oh be. Oh, my God. I mean, I guess Truth he's... Kind- is, Hunter Biden is everything I wish I could be. A crack a crack <laughs> Maybe if you're like an Andrew Tate dad. guy. I mean, he, I, he gets laid. I don't know. I mean, um, I think he pays for prostitutes. But anyway... That's, that's a totally like bullshit yeah. ridiculous. I mean, but th- these videos are like, I'm just walking in the street like a weirdo. She has a lot of these. It's very weird. It's very, very weird. weird. And it almost seems like a parody, but then you look into it and it's like, no, I think this is, I think this is real. This Angela Bel Camino lady, she is the epitome of like 
deranged middle-aged feminist posting on the internet. It is really yeah. kind of fascinating to dive into her uh, social media, uh, social mediaography, if you will. It is uh, something. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll probably try to put like at least a photo of her or a screen cap, cap up on the on, for context. But um, yeah, it's all of this is to say we're worried about women. Like all of this is to say, I know that we spend a significant amount of the time on the show today, kind of making fun of women or, 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 you know, criticizing what they're doing on social media, the mental illness stuff. And we talked about men too, but all of this is to say that I, I I'm frustrated by the fact that women are being driven to this because they haven't always been this way. Like I, when I was younger, I feel like there was a time before social media when women were a lot more healthy mentally, uh, before the proliferation of kind of mental illness, romanticization culture, when women were a lot more healthy and a lot more pleasant to be around. I have an amazing girlfriend who's sitting a couple of rooms over. Ben has his, his fiance. And like, we all, we know that there's great women in the world that you can aspire to be like. And the thing that I find frustrating about all of this and where I wanted to kind of wrap the show to towards the end is there isn't enough positive messaging for women for them to be aspirational towards. Um, what I try not to do on this show is just be sort of a generic manosphere commentator because a lot of that stuff is just women are fucking stupid and they need to stop being mm. such stupid sluts and men should just, you know, take advantage of that and get as much as they can out of that as possible and, you know, get while the getting's good or whatever. It's just really bad, nasty stuff that I don't think is good for you. I'm a monogamous person who thinks that people should aspire to have healthy monogamous relationships. I think that's what's best for society. Um, you know, it's considered a relatively conservative viewpoint at this point, but I think yeah. it's, it's pretty obvious that that's what's best for society. Um, yeah. And don't get us wrong here. I mean, we, we you said we're worried about women. Totally worried about men as well, and there's our, yes. you know, there's a whole other part of this discussion that we kind of had to drop because we've got too much content this week. You know, where I could have gone and on about some of the ills going on in the manosphere right now. It's not only yeah. the Tate stuff. If you've been watching these videos of uh, Rose is Yum, maybe you've seen a couple of uh, about eighty oh, percent of the audience ooh. probably knows what that's in reference to. Men are not doing well either when they're watching Rose yeah. is Yum uh, and all yeah. that good stuff. So we'll probably talk about that too at some point. But um, it would be – I could talk about that for probably about four hours of what's going on there because um, that is layers and layers of like – it's a combination of like mental illness and pornography and social media. Anyway, um, I wanted to bookend the show today though by saying that I really, really want for the content in this sort of manosphere or, manos or manosphere adjacent space – um, but just, just in general, I want content by people who have more traditional views or more, more well-informed views, people who are, I think in some cases, correctly being critical of women to not just be critical of women, but to also do what Peter Jordan Peterson always did for men, which is present a positive alternative. And part of that is telling women what they can do to not end up like a girl on the whatever podcast who's just like, yeah, I just fucking sleep with a lot of guys and don't give a shit and I'm never going to get married and I'm going to die alone. Like, how do you not be that? How do you be the opposite of that? So I came up with a set of, of rules, not 12 rules like Jordan Peterson has, but three rules. And it's sort of based on, I don't know if you're somebody who watches Ben Shapiro, you've probably heard these rules, but there's three rules for not uh, living in poverty. This is a very well-known side of kind of conservative talking point for economic conservatism, which is if you graduate high school, don't have kids out of wedlock and get a full-time job, 98% of people who do those three things do not experience poverty at any point in their adult life. Um, and it's an interesting thing to look into. And I, I think it is, it sends a really important message about like, Hey, just do a few relatively easy things. It's easy to graduate from high school. It's easy not to have kids out of wedlock. It's not always easy to get a full-time job. I'll give you that one's probably the hardest of the three, but it's easy enough. Uh, you won't experience poverty and sort of along the lines of this set of rules. I have three rules that I came up with that I want to leave you with towards the end of the show today for how a woman can lead a good life and find a good man have a happy monogamous relationship. So the first rule is make yourself look as good as you can within reason. So I frame it like that because you should try to look as good as you can. Men should do this too, by the way. You should look as good as you can. What that means is not look like Scarlett Johansson. I always go to her because I'm a I'm a younger millennial. And so she was the, who would be like Ariana Grande? I'm like too fucking old to know who the hottest new starlets are, but you don't have to look like a supermodel is what I'm saying. 
You don't have to, you just don't have to, but you should look at yourself and go, what's how, what's as good as I can look. And that would mm-hmm. mean there's, you know, some subcategories for this role, which is like, don't be significantly overweight. Don't chop all your hair off or certainly don't get a buzz cut. We were watching, I was watching the whatever podcast and there was a girl with a buzz cut who actually walked off the show at one point. Um, and I was just like, yikes, the buzz cut is, is not a good look ladies. I'm sorry. It's not. Um, and then, you know, obviously avoiding just the shit, like really excessive tattooing and piercings and all of that stuff. This just don't do things that actively make you less attractive <laughs> and yeah, you just keep up with basic things when it comes to your physical appearance. And you know, put, you can put on a little bit of makeup, you can wear nice clothes, just look as good as you can look. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there are some exceptions. I mean, I, I try not to do too much talking about how people should look and present themselves because I kind of don't give a shit. But, um, you know, it, it, I, I I've always found it very strange that people are like, yeah, my face and neck are covered in tattoos and I can't get a job. Like, understand that when you make decisions like that, you're limiting the pool of people who are going to be attracted to you to certain certain subcultures. So I think what you're saying is kind of to be generically attractive to most people. But if you want to if you want to limit yourself to a subculture, go ahead. But just understand that that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah, and I w- I would just generally discourage people from doing that because that subculture, the subculture of I have tattoos all over my body and piercings everywhere, my hair is green and I'm, you know, significantly overweight. That's a subculture of people who generally have severe emotional problems and probably didn't have a very good childhood. You you're sure. you're, you're asking there's a saying people accept the love they think they deserve. <laughs> it's like when you when you lean into that look, you're attracting that kind of person, and most people don't want that, and it's usually a sign of emotional unwellness. So yeah, I think generically attractive is a good way to put it, which is like, look, I, I mean, Ben and I, and because we're men, it's not as big of a deal, but like, you know, you say you don't give a shit how you look, man, but you know, obviously you'd have to trim your beard or comb your hair. There's just like really basic things. You have a button up shirt on. It's like, I do that. you know, I have a fucking t-shirt on, but, <laughs> but you know, it's like, I have to trim my beard, comb my hair. I am not significantly overweight. It's men have to hold themselves to a certain standard as well. For women, a little more important just because that's the reality of the world is that men care more about women's aesthetics than women care about men's. But everybody has to, there's, there, there's, you can't go wrong trying to look as good as you can look. And no, that does not mean having a six pack. No, that does not mean having a supermodel body because that's not realistic for most people. People who work full-time jobs and have busy lives can't always be in the gym five days a week. That's just not reality. But you should set a certain standard for what you're going to present to the opposite sex as like, hey, here I am. And really honestly ask yourself, is this something that a significant portion of them would find uh, attractive? Mm -hmm. And when you're significantly overweight or you've chopped all your hair off or you're you know smothered in tattoos most people aren't going to be into that so that's the first rule and it's the it's one of the obvious ones and it's probably a controversial one because you shouldn't tell people how to look or whatever but it's like i think it's important the second rule that i have is to learn like one or two things that you can bring to the table in a relationship other than sex Put in other words, you should have a couple of things that a man can appreciate appreciate about you other than your body. And this can be a lot of things. This is probably, I feel like this is the easiest thing to do because it could be maybe you're an exceptionally just supportive and affectionate and compassionate person. That's a great quality to have for a woman, uh, especially from the perspective of a man who wants to be in a relationship with you. That counts. Maybe you really like to cook for other people. That counts. Maybe you are really game for like male oriented hobbies like sports or video games. Guys love that. There's got to be one or two things that a man can think of other than having sex with you where he goes, I'm glad I have this person in my life. doesn't have to be a lot. doesn't have to be 10 things. It really doesn't. Men are, are simple creatures. We don't need that much. But That's right. in order to have a relationship be more than just sex, you do have to have one or two things where, where you'd go like, this is what a man would value about me other than my body. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to our discussion last week of like having hobbies is a good thing. Bring something to a relationship. Be interesting. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a lot. I would say this is an area where actually men have to do more than women. Men have to have like a, mm-hmm. a, a kind of right. a, a longer list of things other than for men. You could say it's like the body is one thing, but there's also obviously the amount of money that you make. <laughs> but, you know, but other than the amount of money that you make and your physical attractiveness for a man, You have to bring like probably at least a half dozen really positive qualities, if not more, in order to get 
you know, really, really great women into your life. For women, it's like if you're good looking and the guy's attracted to you, give yourself like one or two things and that will get you two thirds of the way there because there's one more rule. And this is the one that sort of goes against the grain of what you'll hear a lot in today's society, which is learn to appreciate good men and show love and appreciation when you have one. This is something that you are discouraged from doing often today. You are constantly told to belittle, degrade, and and just generally be unpleasant towards men because it's somehow empowering. And this is the message that feminism has, I think, propagandized a lot of women into believing. And I tell them they have to do the opposite. If you and th- again, this is one where again it would be completely uh, also a thing for men as well. Uh, you just have to, you don't have to like honor and put on a pedestal the opposite sex. You don't have to never criticize them uh, or, 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 or be oh, yeah. frustrated with them. But you have to, like, like you should be able to answer the question if you're a woman, do you like men? Like, and this isn't like, are you a lesbian? This is, <laughs> this is like, this right, is, we're right, talking right, like right. literally, like, like theoretically, <laughs> like, like on a, on an intellectual level, do you like men? And if your answer is no, you need to work that out before you go into the world looking for a man to be in a lasting relationship with. If you fundamentally don't like men, you cannot have a loving relationship with a man. And and this is something where I feel like a lot of women have been propagandized into fundamentally not liking men. And they'll even say as much. Sometimes they'll say as much like on a date. I had a couple of dates back in the day where girls would basically say like, I, I really think most men are awful. And that to me was a huge red flag. We kind of talked about this on the show last week. It was the biggest red flag for me that I could imagine. So again, the three things, just to reiterate, three simple ways to find a good guy and live a happy, you know, monogamous life. Look as good as you can within reason. Learn a couple things you can bring to the table other than sex and appreciate men and and be thankful and appreciative towards good men in your life. Boom. This is what I want to be out there in the world more so than just like yeah. women posting L's. <laughs> like, like sometimes women posting L's on Twitter is funny, but a lot of the time it's just like, this is not good for me to be looking at. This. <laughs> like, this is not good for yeah. women to be looking at. It's not good for men to be looking at. There's a lot of women posting L's is a microcosm of a much bigger thing on the internet where, yeah, there's a lot of celebratory misogyny. There is a lot of that on the internet. I'll give feminism that. There's a lot of celebrate celebratory misogyny. There's also a lot of mm-hmm. celebratory misandry. But both of those things are very much a thing on the internet. And I really, really want there to be a Jordan Peterson for women. And I can't be that because I'm a man. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) But what either of us can. But I hope that the message that we've kind of left you with on the show today. And Ben, I mean, did you have anything else to say about those three rules? No, those are are all fine. I mean, I'm on that last point, you know, I, I go back to, you know, kind of my general philosophy is, you know, treat people as individuals and there's no reason to be treating any group whether that be men women races whatever there's no reason to have any attitude between all of them and mass because that's just you're first of all just going to be wrong about a vast majority of them and it's just not a good thing to do so disliking women disliking men is just not going to be it's not good for you and it's not good for to to lead a happy life even if we're not talking about just relationships about anything stop Stop looking at people in groups. Look at people as individuals. Yeah. It's not going to work out for you if you lean into these really negative mindsets. It's going to make you spiral deeper deeper and deeper into your resentment. Into your resentment. Yep. And it'll have a catastrophic result. It, it's it's If you dig yourself out of that, though, you can actually be really happy. I'm glad that I dug myself out of a, a version of that sort of misogynist mindset where I didn't wear it on my sleeve a lot, but I definitely had internalized some of it at the height of my sort of incel frustrations. And the fact that I dug myself out of it, and because I always believed that I could find an amazing woman like the woman I am now with, I always had that little romantic part of me that was still inside me. The fact that I maintained that and leaned into it in my mid twenties saved my life. Like it, it is a very important thing for people to do for both men and women. So, you know, aspire to to get along with the opposite sex and to have someone in your life that can be there for you. So with that, yep. I want to thank you all for being with us today on the Veritas podcast. We will be back in a couple of weeks. We look forward to chatting with you some more. Like, comment, and subscribe. Leave five stars if you're listening to the show on iTunes. Let us know what you thought today. I'd love to hear what you thought in the comments down below. We'll see you next time on the Veritas podcast.